Artificial Intelligence Caucus, and Michelle has done a lot of work with that caucus, including um, on the new bill that is out. Let me make sure I get the uh, number right, H.R. 4625, um, the Future of AI Act, uh, which would set the first national framework for artificial intelligence technologies uh, policy. So we are very excited to be here today, but why don't we just start off with kind of the basic question, why is it an AI policy map needed. There is uh, been debates uh, of should we do this as an umbrella policy um, to control all algorithms, to try to root out bias and transparency for all algorithms, or is a more narrow, tailored policy for different applications and different sectors needed? So, and welcome to everyone who's coming in. I think there might be a seat or two over here as well. So. Um. I'll, so I'll, I'll start off, um, and, and thanks, Michaela, for you know that, that great introduction. Um, this is a this is a fascinating topic to me. Um, you know, it's it's a little it's a little bit new for me, but um, I, I've been very interested in AI for a long time. Um, so James is really the expert. We just did a wonderful podcast with the um, with the Internet Law and Policy Foundry on on the subject, and he's really the expert on sort of automation in the workplace. So I'm going to focus on a different area that we've worked on with regard to AI, and that's the use of AI in government systems, particularly in the criminal justice area. This is something that I think has been a really hot topic recently. There was the Loomis versus Wisconsin case um, not long ago, and there was that ProPublica report about um, about machine bias um, potentially against, um, um, I think it was against blacks in the criminal um, in the use of algorithms for criminal sentencing. Um, this I think is a really interesting area um, because it's it's an area where you know the promise and the implementation don't really meet up. On the one hand, you know, there's a lot of value in using algorithms or using automated systems in, um, in, in various government decision making, right? You take out a lot of the potential problematic biases. You avoid, you know, judges who potentially are influenced by what they had for breakfast as to, you know, criminal sentencing, which is fairly problematic. Um, and you, you know, you potentially have a much more scientific, much more reasonable system that ultimately saves costs. Charles, but, is there actual data about how breakfast decisions affect so criminal So we cited a paper. So um, the, the breakfast thing, I think, was, um, was, was Justice Holmes. But um, there's a paper that somebody pointed me to where if a judge's favorite sports team lost, their sentences went up the next week. So, you know, real examples of the sort of bias. There, you know, there's another study that shows that sentencing tends to go up right before lunch and then goes down, or sorry, parole decisions go up right before lunch and go down right after lunch because people aren't hangry anymore. So, you know, real examples of this. Um, and AI, you know, presumably doesn't get hangry and presumably doesn't care too much about sports teams. So, you know, there, there's real potential for this. On the other <laughs> hand, we have tons of studies out there right now showing that AI can be incredibly biased in horrible, horrible ways. Um, you know, potentially by race racial factors, by gender factors, um, by socio socioeconomic factors. A lot of this is due to the ways that these systems are trained and designed. Um, and so, you know, you know how, do we, how do we deal with this? Well, one of the things that uh, we really have to be concerned with is the transparency of these sorts of systems. Right now, a lot of these systems are developed kind of under wraps. Uh, we don't really know how they work. There have been court challenges to try to figure out how they work. A lot of those have been denied. Um, this is going to be a really big area, making sure that there's public accountability for some of these systems whenever they're being used in government. So, you know, I think that, that's at least one thing that we've been very interested in. Yeah. I'll make two points about why now. Uh, so the, the first is, uh, well, people are very scared about what what uh, these new technologies mean for the workforce. You know, are we going to be out of jobs in 10 years and, and that sort of thing? I think a lot of that fear is misplaced, and I can elaborate a little bit later. Uh, I don't think that in the next 10 or 20 years we're going to see mass unemployment caused by artificial intelligence or robots. Um, but we are going to see a lot of a lot of disruption. Uh, we're going to see jobs lost and other jobs created. Uh, we're going to see some firms able to take advantage of the technology and other firms not. And these things wreak havoc on a regulatory landscape because they're just going to put more stress on it. So it, they're going to put stress on our educational institutions and require new thinking about how we train people for work. They're going to put stress on labor market institutions and uh, things that affect employee mobility. Even antitrust is an area where 
uh, the, things are going to be stressed because the technology is allowing some firms to dominate markets uh, across the, the economy. The second point, I'll maybe generalize a little bit with from something Charles just said, which is I think the technology changes the institutions we need for regulation. So today, regulators depend, in, in technical areas particularly, depend very much on experts of various sorts. Uh, if I want to uh, evaluate a car and see how safe its brakes are, we can get an engineer out there on a test track and they can run things, uh, measure things, uh, and they know because of the laws of physics that they can generalize that this car will be safe under s common circumstances. Uh, so they, they, they can make regulatory decisions, or insurance companies can, can, can know, uh, you know what, what the appropriate uh, rates of insurance are. When we're talking about AI, it's different. <clears throat> when you and I see a stop sign, we know it's a stop sign. A machine learning uh, system can recognize a stop sign an awful lot of the time, but computer scientists have shown that there are things that you and I would identify as stop signs uh, that it fails at. Uh, there was a case two years ago where a, a man was killed driving a, a Tesla auto car on autopilot, and apparently the reason was the, the machine mistook a, a semi-trailer truck that was crossing the road for an overhead sign. Now, these machines can identify overhead signs most of the time, and there are inevitably going to be some cases where it makes mistakes, but the question is regulators and, and third parties like insurers need to understand those, understand how frequently those occur, and to do that we need data. Um, so we need more than expertise, we need, we, we need data of some sort. So either it's going to be uh, cars that are driven by one estimate, they need to be driven hundreds of billions of miles before we can get uh, reliable safety data, or we need to come up with other ways of uh, providing third parties and insurance companies and regulators uh, d data so that they can uh, come up with reasonable assessments of how well these, these systems work. Okay, because yeah, if we set those parameters, those policies now, we're still in some ways behind the curve because all that needed, data needs to be collected before they can actually be set in stone or mandated is basically what I'm hearing. Okay, great. Michelle? Yeah, sure. So I should start by saying, you know, all of the opinions I'm sharing today are my own and are not reflective of my boss uh, in any way. But we have done a lot of work on this, uh, on this subject. Um, and I think that something that we found in terms of trying to identify how to sort of regulate algorithmic bias, right, is that it's really hard. Uh, we just don't know that much about about the algorithms, at least in government. Uh, I think we see a lot of the bias on the, on the back end, right? We see how it comes out, but aren't necessarily sure how we got to that place. And I think, as Amy Webb had mentioned, you know, unfortunately, in government, we do tend to be a, a little bit behind the, behind the curve. Um, so I think our hope with our bill, the Future of AI Act, is to, to get a group of experts together uh, to really uh, look at the front end of how um, we're processing this data. And so what our, our bill would do is create an advisory committee under the Commerce Department uh, of these experts and convene them to start to talk about these issues and, uh, you know, to try to determine how best to approach uh, regulating um, in this area. Because it is clear that there needs to be more transparency uh, for sure. And but even with the, can you give us any updates on the on progress? Any oh any sure, new, I mean, edge news? yeah. So we have um, we have seven co-sponsors, which is great. Um, our our bill was referred, at least in the House, to about six committees, which isn't <laughs> isn't always the, the best news because it makes it a little harder uh, to get through. But I think you know, obviously, that's a a sign of how much artificial intelligence touches um, and just sort of how all-encompassing our bill is, right? We want to make sure that we get representation from, from labor, from civil, li civil liberties groups, from ethicists. Uh, you know, all of these people are on the panel um, that we would want to see. Um, in the House, it's been referred to the DCCP subcommittee, um, and so we're hoping... Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection. Exactly. So we're hoping uh, that, that it would get a hearing there uh, shortly, um, and also they're making really great uh, progress in the Senate as well. But to touch on that note, I mean, we, we've we been watching this develop, you know, for a while now as to part of the challenge of policymaking is exactly what Michelle is saying. You have 
so many different applications and sectors that this touches. Mm -hmm. Do and, and the most pressing, and I would love to get some of your thoughts, what Charles had mentioned, <laughs> criminal justice. Like we're dealing with the fallout of algorithmic bias in criminal justice right now. Uh, Jim had talked about we're dealing with the fallout from in autonomous vehicles right now. So is there something that can be done right now, even before a study, or, or how do you see some of these most pressing issues? Um, how, how can we ameliorate that? How can we address those challenges? I think from, from at least our perspective, um, we, need to, we need to be able to start talking about this, this sort of thing, right? I mean, and I know that, I mean, I'm talking to a room of people who are in this every single day and who, you know, are sort of uh, immersed in, in AI and in, in tech, but that is just not the case <laughs> on the Hill. And I think um, truly something that has been remarkable is how quickly we've been able to get this caucus together and um, how uh, excited people have been about this bill um, because people are finally, um, sort of talking about this and, you know, trying to do some work in this area. Um, the ENC Committee, Energy and Commerce uh, Committee in the House, has held hearings on, on algorithmic bias. Um, but I think, you know, Michaela and I had kind of touched on this before this, but it, it unfortunately sort of turned into a discussion of, of net neutrality, it didn't quite touch on everything we were hoping it would. Um, I think, you know, a major concern for people is, is has been privacy um, and how companies are using your data. Um, so I think as far as, you know, government is concerned, that's, that's been where we're starting. I wish I had something better to share. Yeah, you know, if I could just add like a little bit to that. Yeah, please um, do. I think, you know, so the problem is that, you know, these systems are being developed by private companies, right? And that's great, right? Private companies obviously have the incentives to, um, you know, do innovation and, um, you know, they have the profit motivations to come up with the best thing. Competition, you know, works fine. The problem is that, you know, we've been talking a lot about testing problems, essentially, that people will find problems with AI that, you know, the designers just never thought about. Um, a lot of the, you know, for example, um, there's a lot of discussion of like facial recognition algorithms, which only do well with um, with Caucasian faces. That's because, you know, the testers, you know, they just kind of work with the people around them and they didn't have enough minorities to test their facial recognition algorithms with. Outside input is incredibly important to um, to testing these um, these sorts of systems. The problem is that that's kind of incompatible with the basic model of technological development within firms, which is to try to keep things um, under wraps as trade secrets. Um, and so the question is, you know, how do you apply pressure points um, on the companies to you know make sure that they're still they're still innovating, continuing to develop this technology, but also making sure that there are outside researchers and thinkers and um, you know the right kinds of people who can analyze these systems and test them and figure out, you know, what are the things that you forgot to think about when you were designing this? Um, there are a lot of different ways we can do this. We can do it through legislation. We can do it through um, through government-created committees. Um, the federal procurement um, procedures are an important way of doing this. You know, when government decides that they're going to purchase an, an AI or an algorithm, uh, an AI system or an algorithm for criminal justice, um, you know, that's something that can be put into procurement requirements. Um, the executive has a lot of opportunities for this. The judiciary can um, impose requirements through, you know, the constitutional due process or equal protection requirements. Um, there are a lot of different avenues for trying to introduce um, testing and analysis into these sorts of systems. But ultimately, I think what it comes down to is making sure that outside researchers and thinkers have the opportunity to, to look into these systems and figure out what's, what's going on and ultimately how they can be improved in ways that you know, the private companies may not have thought of. And they have the data. And they have the data, that's, <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, back to James. So uh, on that note, I mean, uh, Charles, are you kind of, I'm, I'm envisioning when you started talking, is like should we have a panel, maybe it's a, a, a trade group, maybe it's an, or some kind of oversight group, I'm not sure, to be going into companies that are developing these 
uh, technologies and you know, kind of giving them a checklist. Maybe it's voluntary, but of like, have you, you know, have you have you thought of this? Are you sharing your data here? Or the new popular term is uh, to give a stress test to the algorithms, which I'm, I'm sure you've all heard. Instead of looking specifically at the source code and and you know mm -hmm. potentially uh, uncovering some trade secrets that the company wouldn't want to give out, well, can your algorithm, you know, in th this and this and this test, can it is it not discriminating? So that therefore it's passed the stress test. Yeah, definitely. What do you think about that? Kind yeah, of so so Jim and I talked a little bit about this on the podcast. Um, you can compare it to the situation we have with uh, cybersecurity right now, where companies build these systems and you know they may not know all of the potential security vulnerabilities or backdoors or flaws that are in their systems. So they hire people basically to you know just press random buttons on the phone or send random data to your website um, or you know scan all of the ports on the website to make sure there are no you know there are no open there are no vulnerabilities or something like that. Um, this is you know this is a growing industry in that field. It seems like there's broader application to um, to algorithms more generally of developing a private industry solution toward um, testing and analysis of these sorts of things. And when you say they need data, how would you, uh, Jim, how would you say that data can be shared, again, in a way that's not stepping on some of these private companies? Yeah, th there, there are different ways. I mean, the data can be de developed independently. Uh, uh, companies can provide APIs so that certain select sets of data can be accessed. I, I can make this more concrete. It may be helpful to do so. So a colleague of mine, Catherine Tucker, uh, did a study of uh, uh, employment ads for STEM jobs on Facebook. And they found right away that most of those ads were targeted towards men. You know, this, this seemed fairly biased and fairly, uh, fairly problematic. Um, then they, they went further and they, and they looked at what was going on. And so it, it, it turns out it wasn't the sort of the obvious internal things that somehow slided them, the, the ads towards men. It was that for, for, for at least the demographic groups that were involved, uh, women were, were, were more valuable for other sorts of advertisers. And so the price that Facebook charged to advertise to the, to the women in the population was higher. And so the, the, the employment, uh, the companies that were advertising for employment uh, chose the lower cost men to advertise to, uh, you know, just for that reason. So it, the kind of data somebody needs to to do that is, you know, is it doesn't require getting into the innards of the trade secrets of Facebook. It just requires, you know, some basic access to uh, Facebook's API or or some other things to to do that sort of analysis. And you would think that Facebook, I, I think, is the as, and I think what's going to happen is Facebook is going to start. It's internal test. I mean, all these companies do a lot of testing as it is, right? Uh, they just don't necessarily focus on the things that maybe we would want them, the society wants them to focus on. Um, the, the, you know, I, ideally Facebook may, may start then policing its employment ads and, and internally testing them, but it, it, it's good to have a third party to be able to sort of verify. Yeah, because I wonder when would you be able to mandate that? Like, for example, Charles' suggestion that if you, in the government procurement process, perhaps there would be some kind of data collection mandate. But in other instances, it seems like it would be left up to, to private industry to 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 look at it themselves and make sure there wasn't some kind of transparency issue. Is is that what you're seeing, or would there be another avenue that you'd suggest? Or there I mean, there may be third third parties, uh, insurance companies, or third parties that can certify things. Uh, or some kind of advertising overseer, to, you know, to, to see, all right, how much money is actually being spent on this ad? Is this okay? That would be interesting too. So, look, we talked about some of the issues that have been hot topics in the last year, um, including criminal justice, even social media algorithms. But I definitely also wanted to look at some of the issues that we were looking at for next year with algorithms, including antitrust, the potential that perhaps some of the algorithms held by some of the big tech companies, such as Let's just pick on Amazon for a second. What Am when Amazon can uh, control what you see in their search feed, and they can pr potentially rank those uh, products uh, to their liking, is that an uh, anti-competitive issue? Um, are we going to be seeing more of that this year, as far as concern with algorithmic bias? And then also on the jobs issue, you know, worried about how this is going to be displacing and potentially moving around uh, jobs uh, for U.S. workers in the next year. Yeah, so, well, let me talk about, I can talk about both of those things. <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting. Our, our rec it, the antitrust implications or c competition implications 
uh, aren't just about big tech. I think a lot of the, the press focus uh, and, and, and recent attention has been on big tech. And I think there's some special problems that uh, those, the, the large big tech companies face because they're what's called two-sided markets, um, platform markets. Uh, but what we're seeing is that technology is already having impact on the level of industry concentration throughout the economy, throughout all sectors. So, you know, finance, retail, wholesale, uh, healthcare, um, we're seeing that uh, industry concentration is growing. In other words, the, the top firms are dominating more, taking up more of the market share. Across industries. Across industries. Uh, and this is being driven by information technology already. So think about, for instance, Walmart develops cutting-edge logistics capabilities that en enable it to stock their stores faster, handle greater selection, turn over their inventory faster. It gives them a competitive edge. They can lower prices and compete more effectively. Their market share grows. Or banks can handle credit cards. Uh, what we've been, we're, we're seeing this across developed economies and across all industries where information technology is allowing large firms to d dominate the market and to also earn higher profits. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think we have to be careful uh, in, in an antitrust world where I, I think there are some people who are now saying, well, you know, we're seeing this rise of industry concentration or this rise of profits, and that's because the antitrust enforcers have been too lax. Well, it may, it may be the case that they're too lax, but that's not necessarily what's driving these data. Information technology is playing a role, and we need to understand that. So that, I think that's, that's the, the first, what I have to say about the first question you raised. Uh, the, the second one is about jobs. Um, so there's, a, you know, the, you can't avoid this, this great fear that the robots are going to take all our jobs. We've seen reports that, what is it, one of them claims that within 10 or 20 years, 47 percent of occupations are at risk of automation. Um, and in the next 10 or 20 years, that's just not the problem. Uh, we tend to think of automation as always destroying jobs, and that's just not the case. Uh, perhaps our opinions are formed by thinking about manufacturing, where since the mid-20th century, manufacturing jobs have been pretty much decimated by automation. Uh, in textiles, for instance, we had over 400,000 textile production workers in 1940. Today, it's something like 16,000. And global trade played some part in that, but it was almost all about automation. What we forget, though, is that for the 100 years before that, automation went along with rapid job growth in textiles. We didn't get to 400,000 textile workers uh, um, without automation. It, it, it was... It, it, you know, it was part of the process of job growth. Um, and now that seems confusing, and, and you have to ask, well, why? And, and the reason comes down to the nature of consumer demand. When, at the beginning of the 19th century, when we first started automating the textile industry heavily, cloth was extremely expensive, extremely dear. People had very little clothing. The typical person had one set of clothing. Um, automation came in. It meant that the price went down. And so people bought a lot. They bought a lot more cloth. And in fact, they bought so much more cloth that the number of jobs went, went up, even though the, there was this labor-saving effect that you needed fewer workers to produce a yard of cloth. You come to the mid-20th century, and people have lots of clothes. Uh, they don't need much cloth. Uh, they've got closets full of clothes. They've got draperies. They've got upholstered furniture. Automation is still chugging along, saving labor, but now there's not a incre comparable increase in demand, and so jobs are lost. The question is, we have this tremendous you know, new range of automation coming into new fields and new industries, healthcare, finance, uh, services, uh, and, and also manufacturing. Um, are, are these you know, technologies addressing areas where there is large pent-up demand? If, if there is large pent-up demand, then employment's going to actually grow in, in those occupations. <clears throat> you know, and what we're seeing is a very mixed picture. I, my favorite example is the bank teller. Everybody assumed that the automated teller machine would get rid of the bank teller. And what you had actually, the, you know, I, I, the data say, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the number, <coughs> the number, uh, <laughs> 
hello, uh, the number of bank tellers actually went up. And it's, it's, it's a similar demand story. It, it meant that banks could open up more branches to serve more customers who were being, you know, who it was difficult for them to get cash in more remote areas. They opened up so many more branches that the number of tellers went up, even though they had fewer tellers per branch. We look generally across the economy, and there are some, some sectors and some industries where this same sort of effect is happening, that, that we're seeing computer automation generally being related to job growth. We're seeing other sectors, though, as I think it's still the case in most manufacturing industries, automation is going to lead to job losses. But it's, it's a story about winners and losers, about transferring people from one occupation and one industry and one set of skills to new industries and new set of skills. And that's a difficult disruption. That's a difficult disruption, and that's going to take policy. I would love to talk about what policy that might take, but I also wanted to ask Michelle quick, yeah. is this, when, when you're listening to these conversations happening in Congress, what is the top issue that you're hearing? Is it, you know, are, are lawmakers seeing, when they see the, the, the looming challenges of AI ahead, do yeah. they see privacy, do they see jobs, do they see antitrust, do they see criminal justice? What, like, what's top of mind? Do you feel sure. right at the moment? So I, I think from, and I had touched on this earlier, but I think from the hearings, uh, what we saw um, certainly is that privacy is a huge concern. Um, I think people are really, uh, you know, worried about how their data is being used. Um, you know, you, you can tell when you're, when you're on your computer and I, I, you know, I'm seeing my targeted ads, and I, I know, you know, when I'm Googling something, it's coming up with things that I've, you know, either looked at before or I'm associated with, right? So I think because people can see that, you know, members uh, get these concerns from their constituents, and, and you know, and then it becomes their concern, right? So I think that that's that's been a big issue, and and similarly with with jobs and and the economy, right? I think. You know, there's the, there's this idea, which is true, that uh, it's the government's job to keep us safe, and to part of that is you know protecting our data and making sure that we're all sort of gainfully employed or at least have the opportunity for employment. Um, so I can certainly I certainly understand why those are top priorities, and, and I think that they have been. Um, you know, our bill touches on both of those things. Um, you know, it sort of has four. Uh, cornerstones of what we need to be looking at, privacy, jobs in the economy, you know, bias behind AI, but then also this fourth piece that I'd like to touch on that I think is another really big uh, issue that uh, we, we should be talking more about is uh, investment in, in AI and in innovation, right? Um, I think it's critically important um, that we are the leaders in this space, right? And we want to make sure that we can be competitive on a global level, especially when other countries are acting so swiftly to invest in this area. Um, so I think another thing that is certainly bubbling up that we'll be hearing a lot more about is, okay, but how can we, you know, how can we continue to dominate um, in, in, in these ways? How do we sort of empower our small businesses who want to get involved in, in this space? Um, and how do we make those global connections uh, to sh sort of ensure that we are continuing to remain competitive? And on that note, though, I mean, sure. we were just exchanging notes from the, the talks this morning. I yeah. mean, when we are, as a country, are facing um, China, mm -hmm. who is really positioning themselves mm -hmm. to be a leader in AI, making these huge government investments, right. um, not just in the technologies, but also in things like semiconductors. Um, and yet, the difference between Chinese culture and American culture is that, as you said, there are a lot of privacy concerns from citizens here that are not, you know, taken into account in in China. So, are we ultimately at a disadvantage there, or do you? See, how do I you? No, I mean, it'll certainly. This is. It's going to be really interesting to sort of see play out. Um, you know, I think that, the, like, one of the key differences is that in China, there access to so much more data um, than we're able to sort of have here. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, maybe you have some ideas of how, because you're sort of more in the policy space, how this, how this will play out. Um, but I, I do think it's something to keep an eye on. I, I'm not quite sure myself, just because, you know, as, we are a democracy, right? And so I think that there are, and as such, you know, there are protections built into our system uh, that we can't ignore with this technology.
Yeah, definitely. So, you know, um, I think we were talking we were talking before the panel, so a lot of you have probably seen this um this this um this Axios thing about how um, people have been trying to get the, the government to build a 5G network. Um, toward the end of the document that was leaked, there was a little paragraph about AI. Yeah, I'll just um, stop you real quick. It was from the National, it was a leak from the National Security Council. It was reported on Axios and basically trying to nationalize the 5G network from the telecoms that are developing it. Yes. Yep. yep. So toward the end of that document, there was a little paragraph about uh, about AI, and one of the points that was made was that um, China is leading in AI development because they have so much data because they're not concerned about privacy. Um, so I think that's an interesting point. I don't think it's necessarily exactly the whole story because a lot of AI is not just machine learning, right? There's a lot of AI that you know it's still based on some sort of training or some sort of algorithmic development, um, but it's just based on you know engineers being very clever about how they can, um, you know, about how they how they build systems and how they um, how how they develop them to, to work with existing technologies. Um, one of the so I, I heard the story that I thought was really interesting. One of the really fascinating areas for um, for automation is in sewing. We talked a little bit about cloth. Um, we do not have an automated sewing machine at all in this world. It has just been a very hard problem. Um, and you know the way that a lot of a lot of countries have you know developed industries and textiles is they just have lots and lots of really low paid workers who um, do the sewing by hand. <laughs> That's pretty much how all of our clothes get made right now. Um, the the reason being, it's so difficult still to develop. It's because machines. the cloth moves around, like all sorts of problems. The, um, the DoD actually is um, investing in automated sewing machines mm -hmm. because it would basically save them on a lot of money in terms of making uniforms for the military. Um, it's you know fascinating research, um, but you know that's an area where you know the pro it's it's sort of an AI problem. It's an automation problem. That's not a training problem. Like that's not a data problem. That's a you know a building problem. a machine that that is you know hard to build problem. And you know, America, like American innovation, has always had the competitive advantage in that, in you know, getting getting the engineers who are able to solve difficult problems that um, that provide that sort of value. In terms of the privacy issues, um, there has been a lot of interesting research on the subject of sort of big data analysis that doesn't invade individual privacy. Most of the problems we have with big data are, you know, I'm somewhere in this giant data set, but somebody can find the one row that has my information. I don't like that, right? Whereas the data scientists, they don't care about that. They just care about taking the aggregates and collapsing it into some sort of number or some sort of system that um, ultimately is useful. But they could care less about the individual records. Um, there's been a substantial amount of research into can we give the data scientists what they want without compromising individual privacy or security interests. Um, and so I know that people have been looking into that. That's potentially a very promising area, I think, that'll that'll help to solve some of these problems and ensure that, you know, we have the data that we need to do this sort of um, the sort of development without invading on privacy issues that, you know, are really legitimate and people have raised. How could policymakers support that effort? So it's a it's a great question. You know, I think that there so you know there's regulation obviously, but government uses a lot of incentives um, to encourage technological development in certain in certain ways. So James and I, you know, are we both come from having done a lot of work on patents. Um, patents are famously a way that the government basically channels innovation into certain areas. Um, I know that one of the stories that you told um, was with regard to the, the cloth making, where um, Queen Elizabeth I refused to grant a patent on a certain machine because she thought that would be detrimental to workers. That's an example of how government can actually use various incentives to encourage innovation in one direction or another. Um, you know, we have research grants um, we, in addition to patents. We have, you know, we have government-sponsored research there are a lot of different ways that the government, you know, tries to encourage even private development, which I think are really important to look at. I'm going to take your time for one more question, everyone, and then I'm going to open the floor to questions. So please, if you have a question, get it ready. And, and um, I wanted to ask a follow-up to the discussions for this morning. 
what is uh, what are some ways that the federal government can address this? We'd heard this morning maybe uh, reestablishing the Office of Technology Assessment, which would help educate policymakers with you know non politicized scientists, mathematicians, futurists looking into this. Uh, we had Elon Musk talk about uh, developing an entire federal agency just to look at uh, artificial intelligence. Of course, we have uh, Representative Delaney's bill. We have another bill from uh, DeSoto about uh, studying the Labor Department studying specifically. Uh, James, maybe you'd want to <laughs> talk about that. The Labor Department studying how this could be potentially job disrupting. Um, wh what efforts, is there a big scale effort that you see, or even a little scale uh, that needs to be happening in, in <coughs> immediately? Yeah, I mean, I think that a national intention that we uh, will take artificial intelligence uh, seriously and that this is something that we need to look at a definition, right, a recognized definition of, of, of uh, artificial intelligence. Just sort of once you kind of set that, that intention from the top, I think it, it makes so much happen after that. And this administration has remained largely quiet on that. I, you know, um, the Obama administration near the end there, uh, I think, was focused on this. And, um, you know, I know there are a lot of good people still doing work on this. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do sort of um, in the absence of that is, is uh, you know, support efforts that would bring back the Office of uh, Technology Assessment are to, you know, introduce this bill that would create an advisory committee under the Commerce Department to study, uh, you know, all of these different aspects of AI and report to the, you know, um, to Congress on it. And um, and I think, you know, you, you are seeing more of an interest on the Hill, uh, you know, in talking about this sort of thing. And you can see that in the hearings we've held recently. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that that will continue into the future. But I, I do think that we are, um, we're, we're in need of, of um, a commitment at a higher level that this is something that we're going to be um, addressing. So, uh, yeah, I think a lot of it is, you know, doing more of what we're already doing. Uh, th there are researchers are researchers out there, I, I know some of them who are do looking into these problems of how do we anonymize data so that we can, we can train systems on it without violating privacy. Another thing is it's it's, it's a fallacy to think just about the size of the data as being the, the key thing, that in many cases it's the, uh, the quality of the efforts going into the training that really matters. So you, if you think about Google search, it's not just the sheer number of search queries that they have as a database to test things, but it's the fact that they are running thousands and thousands of different experiments on this data all the time and have developed up a whole body of, of knowledge through experimentation and experience that enables them to, to, to benefit from, them, from, from, uh, from the data, and, and not necessarily the size of the data. And, and we've seen some economic studies which, you know, really go at, at this and sort of show that it's not just the scale of the data that, that matters so much, once you get to a certain point. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, it's supporting those researchers at this point that, it, that may be key and, 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 and possibly providing encouragement for better sharing of data. And Charles, I, I'm hoping that when you answer this question, you could also kind of loop in your first comment from when we started the conversation on there has been some issues in algorithmic bias in criminal justice sentencing. And you said they've come up in litigation, but they haven't, the cases haven't been accepted. Mm -hmm. So then what's, what do we need to do in order to set, you know, a, apart from the court system, the judici judicial branch, what else can be done? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think that's, um, Ultimately, I think what, what it comes down to is there are a lot of smart people out there who are finding these problems, right? There's, you know, ProPublica and, you know, there are a lot of there are scientists and researchers and advocates who find these problems. Um, a lot of this comes down to a matter of connecting those, those folks with policymakers, right? Making sure that, you know, policymakers are hearing um, these sorts of problems and learning about what the cutting edge is in terms of the research. Um, you know, committees like the ones that, that proposed in the, uh, the Future of AI Bill, I think, are really important. But, you know, they're, they're just opportunities for, you know, smart scientists to, you know, be going into Congress or to be, um, you know, going into agencies and talking to them saying you know you're thinking of adopting the system maybe we should you know we should we should think about that right um, having that sort of 
network connection between the folks who are thinking about these problems and the policymakers, um, I think, would go a really long way toward informing the discussion better. Okay. Um, we thank you so much. Uh, does we have a first question? Brief, yes, please, Gavin. Gavin Logan, and I'm with the National Urban League. Uh, my question is for Professor James Besson. Um, one of the things Urban League is very big into workforce development, and so this whole discussion about uh, artificial intelligence and the depletion of the workforce has been squarely within our radar. And I thought what you said about the, the key factor being more toward what is being produced as to rather than the work, the job itself being automated, is more indicative of whether or not those jobs will increase or decrease, or rather the demand for the item. Have you had a chance to think about what types of items tend to be in high demand uh, categorically? And uh, more specifically, and then I guess in addition to that, what about those jobs that don't produce high demand items? So for example, one of the things I propose is ultimately retraining the, the, the lost job so that they can fulfill another function within the organizational structure. But I don't, I don't know, have you gotten the, to that point in your research? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have ongoing research where we're trying to identify how these effects play out in different industries, which industries and which occupations will be most affected. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very much a mixed bag. I, th I think generally we can say uh, things like manufacturing are going to be harder hit in terms of job losses than service sector, healthcare, finance, where we may actually see, and, and we, we have seen job growth. In, in many of them. Um, the, the challenge of retraining isn't even, you know, in some cases we're going to lose some jobs and get other jobs. So uh, a favorite of mine example that we've studied is um, desktop publishing came in and really replaced the, we, re, we, re, we replaced the typographers, the typesetters. Uh, but we we, did, we transferred the work basically to graphic designers and desktop publishers. So we, we actually have many more graphic designers now than, than the, the, you know, the, the graphic designer jobs increased more than the typesetter jobs decreased. So we have a net gain in terms of the numbers, but it's a difficult transition for people to make, a different way of learning, different sort of background, and even the graphic designers themselves have sort of a, a steady stream of new skills they have to pick up as they get into web development and mobile you know, you know, so that the, their technology is changing. So retraining is not only something for people switching jobs and occupations, but it's also within jobs. We have to think about continual learning and that sort of thing. And that, that becomes, you know, we, I, I think we have a lot of interesting experiments going on at this point, but we don't know what the answers are yet. Um, and you'd also mentioned to me in one of our conversations about the need to help people relocate for jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we've seen... A lot of the changes have benefited coastal urban areas at the expense of heartland rural areas um, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, one of the things we've seen, every measure of, of employee mobility is down both, you know, people are less likely to move to get a job, people are less likely to switch jobs, people are less likely to switch occupations, and we don't understand entirely what's going on. Part of it's demographic. but. People are identifying policies that have, you know, that impinge on these things and have some effect. So, we're seeing, you know, a greater use of uh, employer and employee non-compete agreements for technical employees that restricts movement. We're seeing greater use of occupational licensing, which can restrict uh, movement, both geographic movement and movement into occupations. Some people have. There's some new research out talking about how uh, zoning and housing regulations may actually drive up costs in areas and restrict geographic mobility. Um, these are all seri uh, serious questions we need to get a better handle on, but they, 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 they're really a break from the history of this country, which was often much more mobile than Europe or other countries. One more question? Yes. Balancing, 
Yeah, so, and I should, I should kind of maybe give a, a better overview of the bill. So, in, in, um, so what the bill does, it creates this 19-person committee, right, to sort of start to examine uh, four different areas, one of which, um, as I'd mentioned, uh, is uh, kind of the bias of AI, privacy concerns, um, how do we innovate around AI, uh, and then um, sort of finally, like, workplace and the economy. Um, so what the what the committee what the intention is is not to regulate. The intention is to uh, you know bring a group of um, experts together uh, to um, talk about these issues and to advise uh, the Congress on on you know where there might be space to start to start regulating. So I think that our bill does um, sort of. A, take into account or, you know, there's consideration in our bill for, for um, you know, the free press and how, how important that that is. Um, it, it really just depends on, um, you know, how the committee decides to talk about those issues. And, and like I said before, you know, members on the committee, there will be representation from civil liberties groups that would have that at the forefront of their, of their mind, I suspect. Um, so, you know, it was important for us to convene uh, a lot of different opinions uh, and people, um, you know, as well as to get advice from uh, different government agencies and, and um, things like that. So it, it certainly is something that could, that could happen. We do have to wrap up uh, because of time, uh, but before we go, this is a surprise question for all of you. If, you, if you're watching the State of the Union address tomorrow, and you, if there's one thing about AI policy that you wish would come out of President Donald Trump's <laughs> mouth, we're going to do X, Y, Z this year, and it's going to be big. It's going to be huge. <laughs> what would that be? What would that one statement be that you would that you'd think the country that the U.S. really needs to do in the next year? I think just hearing him say artificial intelligence would be great. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, th I do think we're so kind of. I think, unfortunately, we're so far away from that, or, or um, you know, maybe the administration is just sort of thinking of it in terms of national security and not necessarily, um, you know, ways that we can be innovative, ways that we can protect people. Um, and so I think just, just uttering the words would be a huge first step. <laughs> Oh, um, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, I, I kind of on the same lines. I, I would like to hear we're bringing the scientists into the executive office, right? Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna have some some real thinkers who are gonna think about this. I think that would be that would be great. Yeah. It, it wouldn't hurt to have money for research. Yep, money for research. All right. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate you attending, and we are headed back to the keynote speakers. <laughs>